So who's responsible for this unbelievable weather? Okay, go. <laughs> it's, I, I, I looked out today and I said, how beautiful is this? How beautiful is this for, for uh, the final day of the Brattleboro Literary Festival? Um, this year's festival is, I'm not as loud as I was. Okay, good. <laughs> um, is presented by the Downtown Brattleboro Alliance and it is made possible by the generous support of our sponsors Arch Capital, the Howitt Family Foundation, Tim Mayo, the Thompson Trust, the Vermont Humanities Council, Vermont Public Radio, and Ann and Bob Work. Uh, we'd, like, we'd like to thank all of our advertisers and hope that um, and encourage you to uh, buy their stuff, see what they have. There's beautiful stuff around here. Uh, the festival is run entirely by volunteers and has some really amazing real expenses. So um, we encourage you to make a donation to one of the boxes that are around sometime this day. I, I, I'm, I'm used to usually saying sometime this weekend. Uh, there is no flash photography. Uh, please take a moment to turn off your cell phones. Chard. Chard de Nord. Okay. He, he um, is married to my sister. Fact. Wrong. <laughs> Um, his, his lovely wife is here, but he married my sister to her husband um, many years ago. That was, the very, <laughs> that was the very first time I, I ever met him, and I've been squeezing that joke for how many years? <laughs> um, he earned a BA in Religious Studies from Lynchburg College, a Master's of Divinity from Yale Divinity School, and an MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, a co-founder of the New England College MFA Program in Poetry. He is the author of the po uh, poetry collections Asleep in the Fire, Sharp Golden Thorn, Night Mowing, and The Devil Truth. His book, Sad Friends, Drowned Lovers, Stapled Songs, is a collection of interviews with uh, seven American poets, including Lucille uh, Clifton, uh, Jack Gilbert, Galway Cannell, Maxine Kuhlman, Ruth Stone, and others. He lives in Putney, Vermont, with his wife, the gifted visual artist, Liz Hoxton-Ord. Brand new for Chart. And we are so honored to have him here in this position. And, any kind of position, but especially this position, is his installation <laughs> as the new Vermont po uh, State Poet Laureate. Yeah, wonderful. In an essay Chard wrote for the Courtland Review, he said, the lyric attempt to capture a semblance of our fleeting apprehension of ourselves at those irrational yet emotional moments when we feel most deeply. How few of these expressions endure as memorable poems. But those that do resonate like the Lear's uh, uh, strings, vibrating across a void that spans the unknown and impossible. These lines, I feel, encapsulate what is special and enduring about Charge Poetry. Um, his, his most recent book, Interstate, may be his best one yet. Robin Ben said of Char's poems in The Double Truth that these are quiet, bottomless poems of true consequence from under the open. I saw it coming last night, a little black stone in the sky, a speck of dust, a shard of glass between the stars heading our way. See for yourself. See for yourselves what powerful, quiet, unsettling, compelling, visionary poems that he has for you. Thank you, Leah. Very humbled by that introduction. And thank you all for coming out this beautiful Sunday morning. I 
I feel like one of my students in class, let's go outside. <laughs> Leave the perfume room, as Whitman would say. Um, but it's wonderful to be here with this large window and um, this proximity to you and the outside. I'm going to read about 12 poems, um, from mostly from this new book, Interstate. A uh, few new poems. I think it's always fun to read a new poem and uh, cringe suddenly at the sound of it. Which, you know, you, you have a third and fourth ear when you read new poems in front of people. So if I stop in the middle of a new poem, you'll understand. <laughs> My list here. Small black eye. The sparrow lay stunned, but still alive in the periwinkle. A victim of the window that appears as air in the kingdom of birds. I picked her up and placed her wing against my face as she came around. All the world, sky, grass, trees, shone inside her small black eye that was perfectly still as it stared at me like a stone that could see. There's a meadow below our house where I, I uh, where our garden is and where I often descend down to, to uh, just to see what animals might be down there to sneak up on them, the moose and the deer and even bears occasionally. Um, and there's often a, a deer down there um, that I see actually about halfway down. So this, this poem, halfway down, Halfway down, the sight of a doe through the trees in the meadow. I stopped to stare at her, staring at me. The silence arced between us like a wire in a current that equaled strangeness over time. And since her stare was wild, so charged with fear, the moment froze on the line of sky and field, man and deer. She broke our stillness in her flight from me. I stood alone but doubled then as the man on the path and the memory of the man she carried with her beyond the meadow into the next meadow and the meadow after that where she returned my image to the field of her forgetting in which I roamed like a deer myself, remembering. I think as uh, BJ was talking about writing a memoir yesterday in verse, and um, uh, I decided to do the, the same thing uh, in this last book called The Double Truth. It's, in, it's only about 12 lines, but I'm happy with it. I'm not going to attempt to write a mem any more memoirs after this. <laughs> memoir. I willed the knife to hit the mark, and it did, sometimes at the point and stuck. Practice led to skill until my eyes were covered with a handkerchief, and my beloved straddled a wheel for all to see as I threw at her to hit the space between her legs, beside her head, beneath her arms. That was it, all or nothing, my life and hers in a mortal art for every night she was reprieved for having lived, and I was kissed as she was freed as part of the act that traveled the country and built my fame as the man who misses with perfect aim. Um, my, my, my father lived out in Minnesota uh, for the last 30 years of his life or so, and he died out there, so it was hard to get out there to see him, especially at the end. So I used to call and talk to his wife, who was also his nurse, and um, this is a poem about one of those calls. The nurse calls to tell me on Sunday evenings how he's doing how he's holding his own in front of the window with a thousand channels behind the one that saves his screen with snow, fish, fish houses, and eagles, 
how the days hang above the ice as a vast, as vast recycled pages on which he writes in invisible ink. How the sun arcs across the sky, then breaks like a plate above the horizon. How the temperature drops below zero at dusk, then continues to fall till morning. In this way, she teaches me how to speak to him in his sleep at his home in Minnesota, which is the same, she says, as talking to a friend you've never met, but grown close to nonetheless from hearing his voice. I hear the snow falling as she holds the phone outside the window. Silence is the sound of snow falling on snow, I think, as I listen to the flakes inside the air before she closes the window. Of catching them as they dream, then throwing them back, then throwing them back in the hole I drilled by hand when the auger you gave me as a child, whose handle is strained with blood from my turning it so many times into the ice of bad medicine. I wait for her voice to return, then say, just this for now, since any more would disappear the lake inside his head on which he builds a house for us to fish throughout the winter. Um, I came down with a, a frozen shoulder last year. Do you know what that is? Where your shoulder just freezes up? The, all the, you know, the fluid that's supposed to lubricate your shoulder just uh, turns to glue. Uh, so I went to a wonderful therapist, Priscilla, out in Putney, and um, she tortured me for uh, several months, but cured it. And uh, so I wrote a poem called The Pain about this experience. Pain has an element of blank. You know, Emily said that, Emily Dickinson. Quietly, almost secretly, I drove to my therapist for treatment on my frozen shoulder, left my shoes at her door and entered the treatment room on the second floor of the converted house that was her office on Main Street. Once inside, I spoke another language in my native English about the pain I felt, how sharp and dull it was at the same time, how subtly it had grown from a minor injury I never noticed into full-blown adhesive and capsulitis. I lay supine on the table and did as she said, breathe into your shoulder, chard, as if saying my name would empower me to do such a thing. I imagined my shoulder as a lung and grew short of breath as she stretched my arm behind my head and tried to explain I'm creating space in the capsule that's grown cluttered and stuck with the sticky stuff that tissue makes when the joint freezes up. And suddenly, I was an astronaut inside my capsule with tubes attached to my helmet and visor aglow with the lights of the console in my Apollo rocket. I tried to breathe deeper to lessen the pain, but was grounded there on my practice beer with only my mind for a booster in agony for fuel. I felt the rumble of my slow initial liftoff into the blue that quickens to the black space where I floated like an embryo, breathing into a tank that suffed and clicked, gazing down at the earth that was my shoulder spinning around inside its capsule of synovial clouds. I was a visionary in the grip of pain, divining a logic of ridiculous claims. Because the earth was my shoulder, I was the universe with infinite joints. Hardly had I thought this when I felt compelled to repeat it out loud. Because the earth is my shoulder, I am the universe with infinite joints. That's so poetic, she said. You must be a poet. No, I replied. Such thinking is merely an anodyne, which is to say that I believe everyone in pain is on the verge of becoming a poet. <laughs> Your range of mobility has improved, she said, by five degrees, which was the precise distance outside my window between Jupiter and Mars. But I said nothing then. <laughs> we had a 
we had a, a friendly grouse. I, I, I shouldn't call him a pet grouse because he wasn't really a pet, but he just came out of the woods one day about six years ago and while I was raking leaves and uh, I sat down and he just actually popped right up on my knees, sat there for about five minutes and uh, then continued to follow me as a, and he stayed with us for four years after this. And um, his name was Randy, I called him Randy. So I wrote, you know, I knew he was going to leave us after a while, but, and he did, we never knew what happened to him. I think maybe a barred owl got him, but I wrote a little square dance for him here. It's called Grouse Call. Go see doe and say hello to drumming bird. Slow it down and pick it up once and a half and let her go. It's right by right by wrong you go. Turn to your left and freeze the doe. Promenade to the field below. It may be the last time. I don't know. A la Monday right with Mr. Crow. You can't go to heaven when you carry on so. Yellow rock, red rock, oh by Joe. Dangle now outside the no. Timorous beastie, beastie, oh. Well, I, I think I'll read this and um, about uh, three more after this. This is, um, this is at the Putney Co-op, an opera, after Mr. Ginsburg's poem at the supermarket. And there's an upper uh, graph here for him. We will, well, we stroll dreaming of the lost America of love past blue automobiles and driveways home to our silent cottage. So we've need, you know, we've needed a supermarket poem on the East Coast here for quite a while. So why not the Putney Co-op? Go ahead, I say to my neighbor at the Putney Co-op who tells me he can't complain. Let it out. It's mid-March and there's still two feet of snow on the ground. Fukushima has just melted down and the Washington Monument cracked at its pyramidion. Put down your bags and sing. How many times, dear father, gray beard, lonely old courage teacher, must you walk down the aisles as a Randy Edelin humming your tunes for us to start? Our song begins in silence and grows to a buzz. We make it up as we go along, then watch our numbers swell. 10,000 members who have eyes to see and ears to hear who fly like a swarm to join us in our chambers, which are these aisles. I'm singing without knowing it, carrying the tune of mean things, lamenting the prices with Bernie Sanders. My neighbor joins me for no reason, for no other reason than singing along as a member of the cast we call the multitudes of lonely shoppers. I roam the aisles with the sadness of America, juggling onions, blessing the beats, it's a local stage on which the country opens like a flower that no one sees beside the road. In my hungry fatigue, I'm shopping for images which are free on the highest shelf, but costly in their absence. The only ingredient here that heals my sight of blindness. I see you, Walt Whitman, pointing your beard toward Axis Mundi by the avocados, reading the labels as if they were lines, weighing the tomatoes on the scale of your palms, pressing the pears with your thumbs the way you did in Huntington, Camden, and Brooklyn. And you also, Ruth and Hayden and Galway at the checkout counter, with empty bags you claim are full of apples, almonds, and bananas. What can you say to those outside who haven't read your poems, who find it hard to get the news from poetry but die miserably every day for lack of what is found there? It's night. The Connecticut slips by across Route 5. The moon is my egg and stars my salt. I score the music of the carrots, scallions, and corn in the frost of the freezer windows. The suff of traffic on 91 washes my ears with the sound of tires and blue macadam. The doors close in an hour. We'll both be lonely when we return on the long dark roads to our silent houses. I touch your book and dream of our odyssey westward to a field in Oregon, Kansas, or California, where we plant our oars and die, ironically, where we finish our journey as strangers in our native land. These are the lyrics to our song in the aisles, the buzz of the swarm with our queen at the center. 
What America did you have, old howler, when you scattered into the sky, then floated like a cloud as another form in the making outside of time, forgetful at last and empty of all you sang? Now here's, a, here's one new, new poem that I'll read for a friend of mine, I think, who was here. It's called Dream of Heaven. This is for Vincent Pinella, who's the wonderful fiction writer and occasionally takes off for a week or so to write in a Motel 6 somewhere. And um, writes wonderfully in these Motel 6s so around the country. Um, so I imagined myself in, that, in doing the same thing here. Dream of Heaven. I'd smoke cigars all day and into the night while I wrote and wrote without any knowledge or slightest assurance. If anything I scribbled actually mattered or rose to a standard of literary merit, I'd bask in the smoke that did me in and call it the cloud of my unknowing, so sweet with a taste such as it was of Cuban soil. That would be paradise in heaven it's so overrated as endless bliss it kills to imagine as a place for living forever, no less, with nothing to do or lips to kiss. I'd curse, therefore, with the best of them, the legion of saved as I sharpened my pencils and smoked my punches in the simple room that I'd be given with a desk for writing and bed for remembering things I'd forgotten. And reading, too, I almost forgot. I'd read and read since I'd be done sleeping, but dreaming, no, still dreaming a lot. I'd live to live again with moments of dying to see how lucky I was. I'd use my body as an Edelin with invisible wings that fluttered in the void as if it were air and hummed in the dark through which I could see. Here's a short one, and then I'll maybe read two more. This is, just, uh, this is called In the Brief Time We Have Left. Let the ant live that's crossing the table. Give me a kiss. Give me another kiss. <laughs> I'll read this one and one more. In the presence of my enemy, I told him the one about the elder and the towel, then laughed until, and then laughed along until he asked for another drink and I poured him one like the brother I wasn't, only the finest single malt, then told a joke of my own, the one about Eve and the fish. We laughed again. Now everything was funny, and I forgot for a minute that he was my enemy. So entertained was I by his jokes, I didn't know what to say, except, that's funny, really funny. We sat on the porch in the quiet of evening and listened to the breeze and the oaks and ice in our glasses. Dusk fell slowly like a veil at first and then a curtain. A couple of crows in the pines continued our laughter, although we had grown quiet at the table and peaceful in our loathing. This is a poem for Maxine Cuman, who used to come here all the time and died last year. Um, loved her farm, uh, which was on a hillside. Our house is also our not farm, but our um, house is on a hillside, as I said, that descends into our meadow. And. Uh, it's called By the Sweat of My Face for Maxine. Part may be more than whole, least may be best, Robert Francis said. And uh, one more here, epigraph. Earth is not just this that you want to arise invisibly in us. Is not your dream to be one day invisible? Earth invisible? That's from Rainier Maria Rilke from his Ninth Duino Elegy. 
I made a list for each day, which was enough, since I was inclined to do too much in a single day, much more than a dozen men sometimes in a couple of days, so drawn to work and blessed with strength I couldn't imagine paradise without it, much less remember the bliss that idlers canonized as myth, more real than the history of days. Fix the bridge, weed the beans, till the corn, plant some chard, I only get my name in a poem here. I wrote in the box of my birthday, which in the rule of night became an order for the day, like all the other days that authorized my sleep to grant me another day as long as I saw the ruse of difference between each thing. Then wrote with the charge of putting my mind to the dream, which was my work in the garden, the plot that needed me and not the other, in rows of text that merely bloomed to be the genius of my own patch, with only so many days to plant, grow, and reap. So I gathered my tools at dawn and headed down to the field and jacked the bridge that had fallen in the rains, placed a stone the ground had made a million years ago for this repair beneath the beam that had lost its hold on the opposite bank, weeded the beans until it was time to rest then sat for a while in the shade of a willow beside the stream, thought about nothing until it was something as part of the whole that was also whole for being connected to the most unlikely things. Ant, pokeweed, mullen, worm. Stuck my head in the stream like a lure for the big one that always gets away. Walked back to the garden to till the corn only to find the corpse of a mouse inside the case that houses the machine. Back up then to fetch the ratchet and a little shroud to bury her in, slower this time than before and grievous now. One dead, at least, and maybe more than more from catching against the screen when I pulled the cord and it pulled back. Poor mousy, I cried like Burns. I should have guessed some creature was there after finding a snake last year wound round and round the sprocket like a, another cord. So many dead inside the tiller. So much work recovering the bodies. House, housing, mouse, bridge, fountain, snake. I thought like the sky whose clouds erase its blues so perfectly. Like the dirt that smells of the hole and everything in it, words were all. They came to me like birds to a tree, and I wrote them down for nothing with a trowel for the stars to scan as nothing also. So much nothing at the end of the day. I called it darling, darling. Thank you. Alice Vogel is New Hampshire's State Poet Laureate. We got two of them here. Her new book, Interval, poems based upon Box Goldberg variations, won the Nicholas Schaffner Award for uh, Music and Literature. She's also the author of Strange Terrain, a guide to appreciating poetry without necessarily getting it. And three other poetry collections, including Be That Empty, a national poetry bestseller, a seven-time Pushcart nominee and recipient of a National Endowment for the Arts Individual Artist Fellowship. Her poems appear in many journals and anthologies, including Best American Poetry, Poet's Choice, Hotel America, Spillway, and the Inflectionist Review. In an essay in Guadalingo, talking about her poetry handbook, Strange Terrain, Alice talks about a certain book by Jennifer Militello, a wonderful um, uh, poet from New Hampshire. The body of the poem is the poorest thing, imitating our own being. I can walk myself through each line of the poem, visualizing and associating and beginning to feel the truth of the images. 
Not only do I want to, but I can't help trying. But I don't have to get what it means, because I already am sensing the relativity of internal and external body parts, of streets and dark skies, of physicality and light. This is a good explanation of her own poetry. But you do get it in a really clear, ringing way. You do not have to listen, know, or even like Box Goldberg. I don't know if anybody who does it. <laughs> um, but if you do, you're in for a treat. Even if you don't, the poems in this remarkable book bring one solace and brilliance. Alice Bogle. Greetings. How's this working? Does that sound good? Yeah. Okay. So I'm happy to be part of the Brattleboro Literary Festival. I'm, I'm in New Hampshire, but I'm in the Walpole area, and so we're in the same phone book, so <laughs> we're part of the same community. Um, I'm going to read poems from three different projects. I, I, in recent years, have really been into projects. So um, I'll start with the poems from Interval the poems based on Box Goldberg variations. So you don't have to know the music. They inspired me, and I wanted to try to write. Uh, I wanted to use a structure that was not necessarily a given poetry structure, such as the sonnet. So I was listening to music and trying to see if I could steal and borrow and interpret structures, and so I did that with, with the Bach. Um, there's an introduction in the book that explains more about how I did that, but I won't go into all that. Most of the poems in the book are in voices um, because I'm mimicking the voices of canons and fugues that Bach used. So they are speaking to or of and from states of being or others. So I'm going to start with variation one, which is in the voice of God. It's called Yahweh. Explode from the cauldron dark. That's what I do for them. That in mind, into self and other, I divided. In and in, I overlapped in density. And where I was gravid, I breathed their breaths. With my body like a brine spiraling, I stirred the silence till it echoed apart from me. And where I was deafened, I hummed their frequencies. From a floating ground, I fired rounds of clouds flaming. And where they burned, I brewed the rutilated light till it refracted in the wells between comets rocketing. In and in through the ancient rooms, I fell. And where there were thresholds, I left them canyons gorgeous and aggrieved. Flung wide, electrified, I striated skies with ellipsis, color, collapse, shot suns past eclipse, blew the air for sound to sound from touch, touched them till they cried in ecstasy. Out and out and through the skin my sweat ran and poured into hollows so where I emptied, they filled, and though I encompassed, they merely contained. Into the molten cavity, I dropped a stone. I lit the furnace, stretched a hide. I wielded the ragged, white-veined ice and birthed spinning galaxies in atoms, vital alluvium, the eternal quest for me. I remembered and made them forget. I raged and sweetened them. Formless then, I dimensioned space, delineated them. I swallowed my own throat to feed them hungers delicious. Where I could not pass, I corridored their heavens. Where I felt nothing, I caused them passion and urge. I watched them 
and they are blind to me. I lie awake, and they dream. I cry out to them, and they die. I don't actually hear the voice of God. I just, just wanted to make sure you know that. Um, I was channeling a lot of voices for this. It was really a departure for me, too, because I was never a, nar a narrative poet, and not that these poems are necessarily all that narrative, but um, I do everything I can to avoid using the word I and meaning me when I write poems. So it was almost like writing fiction, really, being able to channel these voices. So this next one I'm going to read is actually not in a voice of, a, of an identified being. It's more from a threshold state itself. Most of all the voices are in threshold states, but this is more a state itself. Um, so um, in this poem, I'm speaking of the moment before, um, between calling for God's attention and when you get it. Or might get it. It's called interval. So, you know, the, the book is called Interval, and what I, what I was referring to at first was, in my own mind, was music is just a mathematical structure made up of intervals and durations, and yet we respond to it on such a visceral level, it feels like so much more than that, and I think that's exactly how we feel about our own being. We are these structures made up of molecules and cells and bones and blood, but that's not all we think we are. There's a lot more that we feel we are. So um, I'm thinking about you know all of the intervals of life, transitional intervals, but also life itself is an interval. So that's where the poems grew in, from and into interval. If in the temporal world of the measure of plenitude that spans the vast interstice hanging in the balance, between the invocation and the prayer, O oh, holiest interval, there were no mercy, and God, the invention, said, Yes, I'm here. You rang, why tarry? Say, Yes, yes, I am ready. Death is for being, done with finitude. If in the temporal plenitude the measured world hung in that vast spin, if in the world of interstice measured and balanced spans, if in the hung invocation, O oh Lord, O oh world, the prayer were no mercy, if God tarried in if, if in the unmeasurable interval, the holy plenitude of yes, a merciful intervention, if God rang in the balance between here and the holy, why, why invoke the vast tally if, between ready and death, God said, yes, you prayerful span of being. I am done. I am death for finitude. Why say if why is? So I'll read one more of these. And this one is in the voice of a person. I think of this person as a man. Just It's a stereotype. It's somebody who's having trouble committing. And it's called the equivocator. <laughs> Say that love is a love that cannot die, so that if it does, it is not a matter neither created nor destroyed, and isn't love, or was it? So that to have loved and lost is never to have loved at all. Can love never die with impunity? Is suicide love's only way out? Say love is molecular, pheromones, phoneme, idea, can't it have two or more sides? What if the loved object dies and the love is without object? Then what is the object of love? Or if the object lives, I know, I know, I know, but let's just say, but the love takes another subject to love. Can love not translate, multiply, commute? Can love never be pluperfect nor plural? Would you have it be censored, suppressed? Say love was a love that died. Say love never loved, did what it pleased, made its own choices, got a cat. Or that a love unloved was nevertheless itself a love and could, if it wanted, 
Say love is a love defined by love itself, loves itself, knows nothing but itself, is always one and the same. Is love a mirror, a point, spiral, sphere, a line? What? So say love could wait for us to die, to die, or could wait forever to love its true love who's waiting, so that in waiting to love, it's still a love, although true, unloved, and so perhaps is dead, unless that isn't love. <laughs> so I'm going to read two poems from the most, sorry, the most recent project that I've been working on, which is, um, I'm looking at abstract expressionist art, which I love. And I'm not writing what we call ecphrastic, so I'm not trying to explain it, I'm not trying to describe it. What I love about abstract expressionism is that it interrupts the stream of consciousness and it leaves you in that moment of, huh? And I want that. So I'm trying to write, so I am looking at specific pieces of art for each of these. In fact, I did one for Liz. Well, I'm Chard's wife, Liz, is an abstract painter. Um, so I'm looking at this art and then I'm just seeing where, where my mind goes, where, where am I? And so a lot of it is really talking about consciousness. They're also spread out on the page like a piece of art. Although some of them are not in frames if they're from mobiles or sculptures or something. This one is called, oh, and I just got my eighth pushcart nomination. And that's what this poem is right here. Applicable echoes. But let's keep on trying not to talk about this. Okay? Let's just, cro let's just let it cross our minds without etching through or trickling down. Even if it does, a musical score that went missing, a labor of love plastered over by rain leaked under eaves. Try not to bring up how much the wanting to escape defines our staying, the context that haunts us. Keep coming back to the actual applications of our hands, what they held, what they tried to do before more dark fell. The trees and other things that weren't trees, the interpretations that had nothing to do with what. I'll just give you one more of these. This one was um, a response to a painting by um, an artist named Linda Jones who lives up in um, Burlington. It's called Unnameable. Why waste precious time worrying if arc or cup whether streak or stream, do you understand what we mean by green? Why keep wanting answers to why this, why that, why rose, why scratch, and who is what? We pretend we don't lie when we name, when we imply or provide a personal pronoun for what is a Gnostic art. We substitute name for knowing, as if to gender what is without species, as if to represent what is without us, within. Because we don't have time not to frame the limitations of our senses, we come to these windows. So it's as if at last we're giving up our eyes the better to figure the unformed, forfeiting our fingertips to texture the tints of an invisible god. Here we can name pigment, melted light, name light, umber, name umber, shape, shape, dimension, where we can move out of time and place till finally we're able to be uncertain. Where we are or when or why, what is as if solid and what is like water, what is foreground, or foregone conclusion, or the question. I 
All right, two more. I'm reading fewer than chart because my poems are kind of long. Less concise. Um, so the previous project <laughs> in which I was um, trying to make myself go indoors because I used to write so much based on my walks, my long walks in nature, which I have no problem with at all writing from that, but I just wanted to do something different. So I decided to write poems from inside a house. So um, this poem was exploring what happens when you live with somebody in the same house for a really long time and you're, um, you begin to overlap and also pull away. You, uh, so I'm using syntax and grammar even to do the overlapping and pulling away. There's no punctuation, there's just spacing and layout. Um, certain phrases and words may end one other line of sense, be its own particle of sense, and begin um, another line of sense. So it's a little hard to read them out loud because I have to kind of nail down a little bit more than you would if it was on the page, but here goes. This one is called House of Thieves. Somewhere around a far corner, like a thread, Following its needle through the dark wing, a cricket sings, or maybe a door unhinged swings. The point being, not the end, but because there is an end, unknotted slips through the house tonight. So whatever thieves touch, turns theirs, ends up, there means what was never theirs seems to become what was never there. Fingerprints, the guilty, Pearls and knives shining in other hands, in other words, the past, the names and warranties of stuff, kneeling in surrender in the distance between points of entry and exist, the addict and his fix, between intention and wherewithal, a house can take a hint, hear a pin falling for a song. Is this how it goes with things or without? There goes the deed done, all in the bag, the diamonds, the valuables, along with everything else. They take the variables down to negative numbers, the keys to what's material, nine-tenths of the law fully wedded, holding dearly on by a thread, by such need. How can they take it into their mortal hands? Oh, the empty, oh, it must take so much to want so much. I think I'll read you one more from here that's a little long and involved, but it's, it's more funny, and I've been reading a lot of really serious stuff here, so let me um, find it. Hmm. So one of the fun things about this project was that um, I could kind of walk around and say, okay, what have I missed? Like, okay, oh, I don't have a poem about the attic. You know, and the house is so full of, of, I mean, metaphor. I mean, really, you know, the closet, the cellar door, you know, the cracks in the, between the floorboards. You know, it was just so easy. So um, this one I especially had fun with. It's called the junk drawer. <laughs> the house it admits it doesn't like the junk drawer, its pretense of importance like the narcissist's casual affect, its mind-like reserves of absurdity access the past, and the house is afraid of the past with its secreted shames and dreams. You can hide there old lives, old loves among the single edge razor blades, bells and plastic black spiders creep out the house, not so much when you shuffle picture hooks and stiffened rubber bands or claw farther back to empty penny rolls, loose pennies, unblown birthday balloons, condensed and cramped to, to make more room for newer glue sticks and twist ties, but when you mindlessly manifest the most inaccessible 
stores, of the drawer is an unedited diary, an elevated irrelevance of object and deny. You keep doohickeys sad as dry moist towelettes or eyeglasses without arms, chipped little teardrops for holding a mirror up to a wall. In this drawer, the past is naked as a button and as hopeful for closure. But how unimpoverishable you must think you are with a drawer like that could prepare you for anything, any sudden need to sprinkle air through a jarless, punctured lid, to roll the single die, to live it all again, to leave it to chance and counter the present memory of the wine-tilted celebration from which you saved this cork gone past. But at least you have the cork is something, who knows which thing will catch you off guard and take you away from the house wonders if you save to be free, to forget, or forget because you save each thing you hold onto simply because it was there, it was yours. But the house doubts that you should take prisoners hostage now to then squirrel the hostile world of things combined to rubble rumbling in its sliding tracked wooden box way to never make up your mind whether it serves or subtracts to save the past as if from oblivion, a waste land of the lost thingamabobs, paraphernalia of the parenthetical you hope you are not. Yet the house has seen it all, every defunct appointment card, pocket guide to your chakra energy centers, tweezer and clothespin, and tomorrow we'll shift six unsharpened monogrammed souvenir pencils perpendicular to the drawer and jam it shut for good. <laughs>